Let me just start by asking you guys, what do you care about? Do you care about any of these things? Bushfires? Do you care about bushfires? Bushfires are getting worse. Sorry, I don't need to convince you. A lot of these slides were made for the, H for the AIA, the Australian Institute of Architects, just to say that they should be having a holy crap moment if they haven't already. And that stuff is getting worse. Really bad. I just want to shock them into some sort of action. So some of these slides, you'll be familiar with them already. You've seen bushfires are getting worse with climate change. Droughts. Droughts are getting worse with climate change, especially our area of the country. Less and less rain each year. The Murray-Darling Basin has seen record low rainfall for three years in a row, which has never happened in the past hundred years. So this is something new and something ominous. I'm not trying to sound scary. I'm just saying that we need to get serious about it. Do you care about the Great Barrier Reef? I care about the Great Barrier Reef. I have a son now, a nine month old, and I want to go scuba diving and snorkeling with my son when he's old enough to do that. Unfortunately, in 15 years, the Great Barrier Reef is actually going to be a lot smaller and damaged quite a lot by climate change. Sorry, I don't need to convince you guys, but this is important. For those that care about less the environment, but I don't know, maybe not so much humanitarian issues, but national security issues, this is, on the left, an old projection of what they predicted the sea levels in Vietnam are going to be in 2050. They did their projections for 2050, but recently redid their models and came up with new projections for 2050 given some new information. It's a large portion of the country of Vietnam that will be under the high tide line. You can see Ho Chi Minh City on the top right, on the top right of that peninsula there. That's pretty much the entire blue area, which is under the high tide line. So if you aren't blown away by this, I don't know what it's going to take. This is 30 years from now. By the time my son is my age, this is going to be the state of that country. Where are all those millions of people going to go? Some of them will come to Australia, and for good reason. It's a beautiful country. And we'll have lots of dry weather to greet them. <laughs> Bangkok. A huge portion of the city of Bangkok, which is a gigantic, gigantic city will be under the high tide line. What are they going to do? It's not going to be a simple thing like one flood wipes it out. No, it's going to be lots of little things. It, just erosion, uh, spoiling of water supplies, wrecking of uh, infrastructures, uh, flooding of subways from time, uh, you know, over time. Stuff like that is going to happen more and more frequently. Mumbai. Anyway, uh, that's that's the future, and uh, the presentation on Friday was Homes of the Future Now. So we want to talk about now, what can we do right now to make some action? Uh, I'm always looking abroad for examples of what to do, and uh, you can pass these around just, for, just to peruse. These are examples of real projects, and they're the specs of real projects <coughs> from America has this program called the Zero Energy Ready Homes program. And these are, these are the short list of specifications for projects that are achieving net zero, or they're, have in, they're so efficient that they could easily become net zero. And a lot of these are in climates that are much more uh, severe than Sydney. So it's basically, I'm looking at these maps of large portions of humanity that are gonna be flooded and then looking at these uh, short spec sheets of what it actually takes to build a, a net zero building, and I'm thinking, what, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? I don't get it. <laughs> I've got lots of links at the end uh, of my favorite building science links for you to look at. Um, and basically, I want to, uh,
this presentation was mostly about moisture and air tightness. Uh, I could go into lots of detail about any one of these issues, so I'd love to be back someday to talk to you again about something that uh, really captures your interest. But long story short, uh, these are the things that I want to talk about related to moisture and project management. Number one, early failure is better. I'll talk to, through you with that. The finding faults in your building design. Finding faults in your building design is much better than finding faults in your real building, basically. Um, keep your moisture priorities straight. So we'll talk about the risk of the hierarchy of risk for moisture damage in your build, in your design and construction. And then one main thing, which is continuity is king. I'd love to do a whole workshop on this thing called the, the pen test. We'll do it some other time. We don't have enough time today, but I'll introduce the concept. So again, here's, here it is. Uh, early failure is better. These are stages of the commissioning process. Um, uh, if you're a commissioning professional, a lot of these terms would be uh, everyday terms for you. Um, Pre-design phase, schematic design, and design development stage are, those are early phases of your project design, or project design before construction, and then construction phase and verification phase are those things where you do, you make the building and you do quality control along the way, and then you check the end result at the end. Unfortunately, there's not unfortunately, one other stage of commissioning is the occupancy phase of commissioning, which pretty much is what most of humanity just uses for quality control, where they walk in and they say, oh, the faucet's not working right, that's not right, I'm gonna get the builder, there's a warranty period on this. So that's the occupancy phase, where the, the homeowner or the occupant says, something's not working, uh, I need to call the call the builder, they, there's a warranty for this and it, they should fix that before they are really off the hook. This picture of condensation, it's from my apartment in Bondi. Lots of condensation. So I heard you guys talking about uh, liters of moisture or uh, cups of moisture. Um, w what's the, f the fact that we heard the other day from Mark Dewsbury? Were you there when he, how much <coughs> moisture does each person produce? 40 grams. 40 grams an hour, right? 40 grams an hour, just breathing. So that's my wife and I, 40 grams an hour times eight hours, that's, uh, we'll do the math, but that's several cups of moisture. They have to go somewhere. They have to do something. It's either gonna soak into the, uh, into the wood of uh, our furniture, it's going to soak into the clothes, it's gonna soak into the wall, it's gonna get, uh, waft out through the vents in the walls, lots of, it, any of those things, all of those things are what happens to the moisture. Unfortunately for us, uh, it started making mold in our uh, uh, bureau, our dresser. What do you call it here? I'm not sure. Drawers full of clothes. Some of the clothes started going moldy. I was astounded at this, but that's only because we have absolutely no insulation in our walls. So when it turns cold outside, it's cold inside and the uh, clothes then become uh, insulation, which then makes a dew point within the insulation, we get dew inside the clothes and mold in our clothes. Sorry, I go off on a tangent. I could do a whole presentation about my apartment and why it's a big mess. Um, here's some occupancy commissioning of a, a building uh, near Sydney. You, I blacked out all the names so you can't see where it is, but maybe some of you know this building or others like it, where they're getting complaints of condensation in all of the apartments. So they're, they're uh, messaging each other on their Facebook group. Hey, I've got condensation tonight. What happened to you? What are you doing for it? Uh, and uh, I'm running the AC. I bought a dehumidifier at, at uh, Harvey Norman, and that's what I'm using, and, and they empty it every night with all the humidity. So this is real scary stuff for a lot of people who are just buying houses in this very expensive real estate market. So this is some of the, some of the images from there. Mold coming, uh, soaking into the plaster, uh, the paper facing on the plaster board. You can see condensation on the windows. Of course, uh, if you know anything about windows and thermally broken windows or not thermally broken windows like these single pane windows with aluminum frames, aluminum frames, sorry. Um, they are basically condensation devices. If you could collect the condensation in some constructive, organized way, it would be a great dehumidifier because they really work. As soon as it gets cold outside, it just starts raining on the inside. Could be great. 
if someone should uh, come up with a solution for that. But look, they have mold in their drawers. Uh, the tenants are passing advice to each other. Maybe you can use this damp rid stuff. Maybe you can use these things from Harvey Norman you put in your microwave and then you put them in your drawer. A lot of that stuff doesn't do anything. A lot of it actually makes it worse. Um, so it's pretty hopeless. Again, more mold, clothes, moldy. Uh, so we got called in, uh, someone in the know said, why don't you call to get a, a blower door test? Find out, are the apartments too tight? Are they, uh, does the air tightness cause problems? Uh, do we need more fresh air in the, in the house, in these apartments, or uh, are the windows part of the problem? And the answer to all of those is no, or not really. Uh, it's more nuanced than, than that. Air tightness itself is not the problem. It's not the only thing. Um, so I'm going to plug this a few times here, attma.org. Uh, the Air Tightness Testing and Measurement Association. It's a UK organization that all of the air tightness testers in Australia are joining to basically organize themselves into a competent person scheme so that we can go to the government and say, look, we've got all our stuff ready. All of our homework's been done. We're ready. If, if you want to add <coughs> air tightness testing to the building code, we're ready. Let's go. Let's do it. There's no reason to stop. That's what ATMA is for. It's a, a UK organization that we joined. All of us decided to join it in New Zealand. They're doing the same. Uh, all the air tightness testers there, at least the ones that do this on a commercial basis, are joining uh, ATMA. So it's going to be a good organization force for, um, for the testers in Australia. Back to this project here. What's causing the problems here? If uh, you use some commissioning terms, uh, what's your basis of design? If you said, I'm going to build a, build a building with tilt-up concrete panels, which are automatically airtight, because they're just solid concrete blocks, and then I'm going to use intermittent indirect ventilation, like uh, this, uh, the range hood uh, is a recirculating type, so it takes the moisture and then just blows it back in your face. Uh, the uh, bath fans, you, they have a working bath fan, and it actually works pretty well, but as soon as you turn the light off, the fan shuts off. You could have a timer to delay that and help dry the, the place out a little bit more. The, the uh, dryer, has the, it actually comes with an adapter so that you can convert it from uh, blowing, just blowing the humidity into the apartment, and then to convert it so that it can blow the humidity out through a tube and outdoors, which is what you should do with that humidity. They even have a fan in the ceiling to draw air from the general area of the, the uh, dryer and then direct it outside. But it, they could save money, get rid of that extra fan that they have in there, get rid of that uh, damper, that uh, register on the ceiling, and then connect that duct directly, just make it right outside, and that would be a much better solution for this moisture problem. Lots of things. Uh, so if you said, that that's your basis of design, I would say, you know, if you have a very tight apartment with insuffi insufficient intermittent ventilation and a poor building envelope full of single pane windows and, and very poor uh, and steel framing with uh, poor low performance fiberglass, are you going to get condensation and mold? I would say yes. If you build the same, next, same design for your next building, you're going to have the same problems. Not a big surprise to me. So risks of moisture damage for your projects. Are, can you raise your hand if you're involved in building construction or design? A few of you? Anyone uh, who lives in a, in a house? All right, who lives in an apartment? Okay, so um, these are when you're looking for moisture problems, the cause of moisture problems in your house, wherever you live, this is usually the, the order of how things go. We've got, and then, uh, well, sorry, let me go back to the slide if I could. Um, liquid water is your, most, is your biggest danger, followed by air leakage, which might be a surprise to some of you. And then vapor diffusion through solid materials. If you didn't know that water vapor could diffuse through solid materials, uh, take a bag of chips and then consider the, the, the wrapper that the bag of chips is in. A, chip, a bag of Doritos, corn chips very, uh, absorb water very quickly. 
So they've got foil, a uh, foil bag. And that's, foil is very, very good at stopping moisture transport straight through that material. Some things, if, if you had chips in a paper bag, within hours they would be stale. And stale just means they've absorbed moisture and now they don't crunch like they used to. That's what we love with chips, to crunch. So um, that uh, foil uh, wrap is a vapor control membrane. Other control membranes to control these forces of, of nature that are acting on your building are water control layers, air control layers, and thermal control layers. Thermal control would be things like, uh, well, things that they don't have, like the uh, single pane windows. There's no thermal control there, very little thermal insulation. That's why you get condensation there. So, in terms of risk, vapor diffusion, soggy chips, that's probably your, your uh, biggest threat right now. Um, but it's probably a hundred times more important, and there's calculations to show this, that air leaks around a very well, a uh, very good performing vapor control membrane, air leaks around it, the water just, uh, water vapor is uh, in solution or uh, it's coexists with air, uh, nitrogen and oxygen, and just has a highway right around this nice control membrane. So air leaks are very, very large uh, transport mechanism. Can you still hear me back there? You can, okay. And then of course, water leaks. That's definitely your most likely source of water damage. So, if you haven't heard this before, say it with me now, build tight and ventilate right. Okay, ready? Build tight and ventilate right. All right, good. That's what you need to do. Uh, look, this, this slogan was invented in, I don't know, Sweden like 50 years ago, but it's still relevant today. We actually should probably, in Australia, make it more like ventilate right, and then you can afford to build tight. Uh, because ventilation is uh, really uh, inadequate by the Australian standards and um, building code here. So ventilate right, that's, we want building uh, people's health first and foremost. Once you have established good ventilation, then you can really concentrate on eliminating every last uh, liter of air through your building assemblies. There's no good use for air leakage through your building, your walls and, and roof. So if you haven't seen this before, this is a blower door. It's a blower and a door, and it's a, uh, it's a fan that you use to induce a pressure on your building envelope, your house. It's, it seems, it's actually kind of uh, so simple, sort of a dumb tool, but it's actually really, really powerful for many, many reasons. Uh, the typical blower door test is you set it up, it's a temporary thing, set it up, hook it up to your computer, the computer runs the test for you, uh, it can, um, and, uh, oh, sorry, that's a, a, another picture of a, a blower door there. The good thing about blower doors and why building codes around the world very frequently use them as an enforcement mechanism or a compliance mechanism, why ATMA exists, is because it's a great tool for regulation. It's really great. For, uh, it's actually been added to the 2019 NCC as an option. It's not mandatory anywhere, but it's an option. So if you, anyone involved in local government around here? Okay. I would love to talk to you about possibly getting some incentive for doing air tightness testing in your jurisdiction, your local area. So uh, I've done some presentations for Kuringai Council and they have incentives for people to go to these things. They pay for presenters to come. You could use some of that money and then put it towards, give uh, people who get an air tightness test in your jurisdiction, they could get a, a little bit of money towards their next blower door test. And uh, so that's incentivizing a best practice for building code in your jurisdiction. That's what we, this is the argument we're making to the building code. It's a way if mandatory testing is where we need to go in the building code and we're at zero right now, how do we get from here to there? There's a lots of steps along the way. And one of them is uh, some light incentives for these, these sorts of things. The reason it's a good tool for regulation is, well, for designers, if you're looking for energy savings for your project, how do you, you do an energy model and you want to find cheap energy savings, well, the fruit of energy saving, uh, the, the tree of energy savings, the, the lowest, juiciest, lowest hanging fruit is the air tightness fruit. It's so juicy. It's so cheap to make 
uh, energy savings from improvements in air tightness and also improvements in building durability with some basic control, uh, basic quality control with your air tightness, uh, both in design and in, in construction. Really cheap energy savings. Um, builders like blower door testing, actually, if you can believe it. Builders like the testing because if you have to meet a number, it's just a number that you have to meet. You do this test and it gives you, it spits out a number, permeability of 5.6. Now, once you uh, have that number, or if you're forced, the building code says you have to get less than a permeability of 10. Otherwise, you don't get that, you can't use that as a compliance method. So you'd say, um, well, if all I need to meet is this number, I've got, if I'm a builder, I've got my freedom to choose however I want to meet that number. You just tell me the number and I can find the lowest cost way of doing what I need to do to get to that number. Some would say that's uh, the builders being lazy. You, if you look at the data, it's like uh, the targets that, that they set in the building code, say they set a target of five. Well, like 80% of the, the uh, test results come right around five. Uh, you'd say, wow, that's a lazy builder who doesn't do any more than he's asked to. Well, that's exactly what building code is. It's the worst. The building code is the worst building that you can legally build. You can't do any worse than that and be still complying with the law. So I would say for the builders, they're actually finding this is a free, the free market at work where you say, here's what you need to do. Now it's up to you to tell me, how are you going to do it? You have freedom to tell me how you're going to do it. So I think it's an efficient market mechanism in that way. The other cool thing is that uh, blower door testing gives feedback to uh, uh, the, the builder when they're, they're doing the test. Anyone seen a blower door test before? Oh, cool, a few. Anyone own a blower door? No? All right. Anyone want to own a blower door? <laughs> All right. Um, so I would be, uh, I would, actually be uh, willing to talk to one of you about coming to do a blower door test if you had uh, maybe we can't do a blower door test on this place because there's so many vents here that it wouldn't make it it, it wouldn't get in any pressure anyway um, but we could do a test on on a house or something do a meeting in the future where we do a blower door test on something and then you can feel what, with the blower door running it's sucking air through the through the fan and then the replacement for that air comes in through all the gaps and cracks around the building so you can walk around and touch and feel with your own hand you can use the the toilet paper test where you take a strip of toilet paper and you dangle it in front of the leak and you'll see the toilet paper start fluttering when it encounters a leak you can use little smoke bottles to do a little puff of, of dust and it puffs out so there's lots of ways to find air leaks and it's kind of a cool uh, detective uh, story for you it's it's a lot of fun and it gives builders likewise gives them feedback on what leaks is what they're doing working next time? Can they do something better? Can they do something that strategy that they chose this time? Can they find something cheaper next time that achieves the same outcomes? I think they'll find that. So the blower door test, because it's repeatable and it's measurable and it's numerical, it gives the opportunity for learning, which is really powerful for the building community. Learning and improvement. Oh. ATMA, I'll plug it again. Air Tightness Testing and Measurement Association. Look up your local ATMA tester. So, uh, I'll just go quick through some moisture problems here. Here's a swimming pool. Very, very risky building enclosure around a swimming pool. Lots of humidity. Very high vapor drive from inside to outside. Pretty much in most hours of the year. Vapor drive from inside to outside. So, you better get your control layers right. If you don't, the roof parapet there show, lights up nice, nice and bright with an infrared camera. That brightness is caused by air leaking through this assembly. It's so humid in there, the HVAC can't keep up with the humidity to keep it down. It just keeps pumping fresh air into there to try to keep it uh, at temperature. But it's, uh, what that's doing is uh, speeding up the evaporation from the pool. Water heating, air heating, uh, AC costs a lot more in this building because of air leakage. And then, oh, it's so miserable. This building is a couple of years old and it's already got massive amounts of condensation in the roof. Mildew, it's brand new. I mean, is plain sheet metal supposed to grow mold and mildew? No, 
but just the slightest bit of dust in that parapet, just from the blowing, traveling on the wind, provides enough nutrient, nutrition, and all you need is moisture. Heat and moisture and nutrition equals mold. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty uh, ripe recipe there for mold. So here's a good article here. I'll, I'll give you this link at the end of this presentation as well. Uh, Energy Vanguard, two rules for preventing humidity damage. Rule number one is either keep humid air away from any cool surfaces, or if you have humid air, keep the surfaces that are in contact with it, keep them warm. It's two ways, basically two flip sides of the same thing. So which strategy are they using here? Definitely not uh, keeping the humidity away because there's plenty of air leakage. Look at that quality vinyl tape that they use there to tape that joint. Really good, it's really good. Okay, so doing the pen test on your next project, that's what this is. You take a red pen and you draw where the control layers are supposed to be conceptually. Uh, and then you'll start uncovering discontinuities in your, uh, in your design. So where's the vapor control layer supposed to be in this design? Is it at the ceiling level where there's hundreds of these hangers and little penetrations hanging up this suspended ceiling? I would say if that's your strategy, that's a pre pretty problematic strategy. You've got lots of details to fix there and make sure you don't screw up. That's difficult. The alternative is, well, we're using the, uh, we've got a foam, solid foam roof, so that's okay. But then this parapet, it's very, very poorly detailed. You saw in the last picture. So there's tons of air leakage just dumping through this root parapet assembly and just dumping lots of moisture in there as it goes. This building is going to meet an early end. So either keep humidity away from cool surfaces or if you have humidity, keep the surfaces that they're in contact with warm. So those are your priorities. So here's a good... Um, reference for you. You can download this for free. The EPA Moisture Control Guidance for Design, Construction, and Maintenance. Really good. And it has a good appendix in there about how to do the pen test for air control layers, water control layers, and thermal control layers. So that one, the thermal control layer that they had wrong in that, that apartment building with all the condensation on the windows was they had no resistance to condensation in that design because you had aluminum single pane windows. And as soon as the temperature dips outside, you've got so much humidity, the dew point, it reaches that dew point like that. You know, right, uh, just maybe a month ago, it was probably making condensation still. So that's, if, if you were doing a design review, you'd say, well, your thermal control uh, layer here is pretty discontinuous at those very poor windows there you might get condensation. That's something you can find out in design years before the building is built. So I'll talk about control membranes. Let me just make sure, okay, 15 minutes. I'll keep on time here. I won't go into this too far because I'd love to talk to you more about how to specify for your next project for air tightness, how to actually make it happen. And sometimes people will uh, pick up a business card or a, an uh, some literature and they'll say, we want to specify Proclima on your next project, uh, on our next project. Uh, we, how much does a membrane cost? How much is uh, two rolls of the membrane? And I shake my head because I think I would actually rather not sell membranes to someone like that because they don't have the whole picture of what actually makes an airtight building system. It's not just the materials. Those materials are joined by, they all go into, the, the system is the whole building, the whole enclosure. And the whole enclosure is made up of roof assemblies, wall assemblies, and floor assemblies. A lot of times the floor assembly is pretty simple, it's poured concrete. In a lot of buildings it's not. Uh, it's on, on stilts, then you do have an air barrier that you have to execute there. But for walls, you need not just the wrap around the outside, the materials, but you need the things to join all the joints in the wraps. And also very, very importantly, you need things to protect your building from moisture damage. So all the flashings that are really, once you get, if you, all you do is you buy the, the membranes, you're gonna get water leakage someday. And you need that water leakage to dry out. So that's material choice, but you first need to protect your building from moisture intrusion. I've got some cool 
Uh, there's some cool YouTube clips coming out on that soon. So all of your assemblies, your wall assemblies, roof assemblies, are punctured by these things called windows and lights and uh, bath fans and doors. There, you take your really nice air barrier assembly that you've paid lots of money for and all the accessories to join them, and then you start poking holes in it. Well, those components are the things that poke holes in there. So just want to say, uh, be aware that not all materials what you might think of as the outside or the, the air barrier for your building, not all those materials are actually airtight. So face brick by itself is not airtight at all. Once it's been treated like these bricks here, this cavity brick, it's also quite, quite thick. It's been painted over that. I would call that, yes, that's airtight. That assembly there, that wall assembly, that's airtight. It's been treated to make it airtight. Bricks by themselves, a single layer of facade, brick facade, not actually an air barrier material. Any of these other things, like the weatherboards or the, the metal, uh, sheet metal, cladding. The materials themselves are airtight, but all the joints between them are where the air goes right past it. So uh, the materials themselves don't make an air barrier. So here's the pen test. We won't go into it. You can have that fun later, but I'll just go, uh, go through this real quick to say, Here's how you, here's the concept of a red pen test where you take building plans and you decide to draw a line around where you think, where you designate the air barrier control layer to be. I have a slide here that shows uh, they've done studies for projects with an air barrier specified and those without an air barrier specified. And there's a huge difference between them. So you'd think, well, yeah, right, researcher. Uh, you're telling me that all I need to do is specify an air barrier for my project? Well, kinda. The reason is that when you specify an air barrier for your project, that gives you something on your building plans, and it gives you something in real life to point to and say, that's the air barrier. That is the line that shall not be violated. You can't cut that. You can't, you, if you make any holes in that, you have to tape it up. That's what the, in construction, that's what the function of the air barrier that single line is in construction. On your plans, it's also the thing you do, you designate with your, your pen to show this is where the air barrier is. And uh, I'll go into it more someday about uh, moisture control and how the, that same thing really applies to moisture control as well. Defining which spaces are wet and which spaces are dry. Lots of building, if anyone's uh, involved in building failures at all, please come talk to me because I love to show Love to share dirty pictures of uh, mold. So, in the red pen test, often here's where people get tripped up. They start drawing the line around the outside. They say, yes, this is the separation between inside and outside, very good. But then they get to the garage. What do you do there? Here's how I would define the air barrier in this particular project. I'd say it goes around the garage and then around the rest of the exterior of the building, which is very obvious. But what this means is, here's something that doesn't often get done in, in construction. Once you define this as the air barrier, then all these things start occurring to you. Oh yeah, what am I gonna do about, uh, well, the door to the garage? It's not typical to put, uh, to put a door seal on that garage door. Well, smells come in that way. Bugs come in that way. Car exhaust comes in that way. Noise comes in that way. Uh, energy loss comes in that way. That's a door that gets ignored because it's not technically outside. You're not going to get rain under that door, but it's still between conditioned space and unconditioned space. Basically an energy loss pathway. These other complicating things, once you draw the line, you say, oh, the NBN, what am I going to do there? What about Am I either going to put that NBN box outside the conditioned envelope and then uh, de uh, then detail all the penetrations through it uh, from that NBN box, all those wires going to the inside? That's problematic, but also possible. The other, other way is to make sure you include it within the conditioned envelope. And then you won't get, basically it becomes irrelevant. Um, the plumbing services, you could fix whether these plumbing services are going to be a path for bugs very easily by extending or contracting that 
garage by 50 millimeters or the, make the, the bathrooms a little bit narrower by 50 millimeters. That gives you enough space to run your, your piping on the inside only so that anything, any of that busyness, any of that mess of all the penetrations, all the noise with um, putting all your cabinets there and your uh, uh, pipe penetrations, all that stuff, all that business happens to, on the inside of your air barrier. It basically becomes irrelevant. You don't need to seal all those, those gaps underneath the sink then because it's all inside. When you do a blower door test, because it's inside effectively, it's not going to leak. So that's how I would draw the line for the air barrier for the garage. Here's an example where a builder has done this, taken that exterior membrane and wrapped it around the garage before they finish building the garage. That's the right. That's a step in the right direction. I'd say they need to take some more steps, but it's a step in the right direction. Here's a total ignorance of that fact. They've got the, the sarking around the outside to protect from rain so that they can start doing things inside, but then there's no separation between the garage and the rest of the house. There's that wall that you can see through, that's pretty much that same wall uh, leading to the rest of the house. It's easy and cheap to make big gains in air tightness and bug control and fire safety for things like that, uh, that particular boundary there. So, all right. Um, I want to show you how, when you're doing a blower door test, you can use it to, as a scientist, to find and identify the sources of the leakages that you see. So with a fog machine, they're doing a fog machine under positive pressurization, so it's forcing the fog out through all the gaps and cracks. It's squeezing out around this door frame. I, I won't, uh, I'll tell you that this, of all those things I mentioned, uh, assemblies, which are made up of materials and the accessories to join them, and they're punctured by components. Which leak is this? Is it an accessory, a component, an assembly, or a material? I'll tell you, it's a leak in a component. The, the window itself is leaking. So you can see there's just a very rudimentary uh, seal on this window. So that's a component that if you were, say, doing a passive house, you'd say, it's not good enough for my passive house project. I need a better component. I'm going to have to spend more window, more money on the windows, that, that line item on your, your bill. This leak under the garage door, it's making this paper flutter. What's that? That's a missing accessory, a door seal underneath there. That's a missing accessory that could be fixed just by putting the accessory there. It's not more of a systemic problem. It's a local thing. It's a thing that can be fixed right then and there. This though, this is an internal socket. It's on an interior wall. Why is a socket on the inside of the building leaking? A blower door puts pressure between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. So why would, if you've got a, a, an outlet right in the center of the house, why would that one be leaking? Very good, students. Yes, it's, there's no sealing assembly, a very imperfect sealing air barrier assembly. So to make quick work of that, you execute an air barrier assembly along your roof and prevent the, the uh, along your, your ceiling and prevent the air leakage from the roof space going down into the, down through your top plates and then feeding all these interior leaks here. So that's uh, a missing ceiling assembly. It's a design choice. It's a design choice. And there's lots of pluses and minuses with, with all those design choices. So you're saying, uh, so we call it a vaulted ceiling or cathedral ceiling or a hot roof. So if we were to have insulation along this, the roof of this room here, that would be uh, ceiling along that slope. Well, the surface area of that slope there is approximately double the surface area of the hypotenuse of that triangle right now. If we were to insulate the ceiling of this, that's twice as much heat loss uh, through that surface area at night. It's all radiating to the out, uh, night sky. So uh, there's some benefits though, in that uh, any of this business, like all the light fixtures and interior sockets and things like that, basically become irrelevant because now you've executed the air seal along the roof. If you use a truss roof, it becomes insulating along the roof and air sealing along the roof becomes impossible. You can't. So there's lots of design choices. It's not a, not a simple question. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to all of them. So anyway, um, 
this leak at this garage, at uh, the uh, range hood over the, the hood of this, sorry, the range hood over the cooktop. There's, he's saying, well, there's a bunch of air leaking from that. Well, it could be uh, a missing component, like there's no uh, damper on the exhaust fan where it terminates outside, so it should have a damper by code. Um, but uh, if it's missing, maybe that's, maybe that's the cause, maybe it's not. Um, but I don't think so, actually, because if the air were leaking from that, it would be leaking from the bottom, from the vent itself. But it's leaking from the cabinet. So is this an accessory? Maybe where the, the pipe for that goes up into the ceiling, the roof space, and then goes outside? Maybe. Maybe if there's no uh, accessory to seal around that pipe, maybe that's it. But I think there's actually no assembly at the roof, uh, at the ceiling above this. Now, to get that, shoot, I have another slide somewhere here. To get that, that assembly here, this space uh, right here, that's, that's all the cabinetry for the, uh, for the kitchen. So to make those cabinets not leak, usually when you do a blower door test, you turn it on and, and you go under the sink and say, oh, wow, look at that, oh, it's gushing air. So much air coming from that, uh, those pipes under the kitchen sink. And that's where the bugs come in, from the, the gaps around your pipes to the, go straight to outside. And at least they do in my apartment, they go straight to outside and then down and out to the drain. Um, so I could make all those leaks irrelevant all the cabinet leaks by making an air barrier along the back side um, and then on the top basically it's a sequence of operations for the builder put a uh, 10 mil thick uh, sheet of plasterboard up first then screw that in then put the framing up to make your drop soffit under there and then fix the cabinets to that you've made an air barrier out of a very very cheap piece of material which is just plasterboard so, uh, that to me, this leak tells me it's a missing assembly, which could be very cost effectively canceled on their next, next house. Same one. Here's one, I asked the builder, why did you put caulking on one side of this window, but then not the other side? And, he, and uh, the tester was saying, oh, pfft, oh, it's just a lazy builder. Well, the builder actually said, we only put caulking on one side if the gap is bigger than 50 millimeters. If it's smaller, we don't do the caulk because it's, it's just for appearances. And the, the tester said, oh, what a lazy builder. Actually, I'd say, you know what? This shouldn't actually matter, and here's why. So that's where the leak was showing up around there, and, and someone would say, that's not a leak in the component. I would say it's not the window itself that's leaking in this situation. It's the assembly behind it. Here's a brick facade. Take the brick facade away. Typical construction is no sarking on the outside, no membrane on the outside. This is what it looks like in typical construction. Just face brick there. Believe me, it leaks a lot. So take that assembly with a face brick and put a membrane to enclose it. Accomplish all the, the proper flashing to make sure that drains, re repels liquid water, your biggest danger. Water is your enemy, I have to say, when it comes to building durability. Uh, then once you do that, you've really actually pretty much canceled everything else that comes after it. So uh, whatever happens outside, the um, brickwork doesn't matter. It's out, out of the equation because the air leak has been stopped at the window pane. So these are some YouTube videos that are going to come out showing what happens when you spray water on typical construction and then uh, better construction, which we need in Australia. Typical construction, just some foil sarking there. No flashing, believe me, this is typical because I've got uh, 100 pictures from typical construction, just random construction sites to show no flashing around the windows at all. It's just the sarking. It's just supposed to drain like a raincoat and never, hopefully the wind never blows. But uh, you can see just water absolutely gushing through that, that leak there. And then you do the same thing with, but with an actual, some actual flashing around the window and then taped seams basically it becomes a non-issue. That same corner on the other side is bone dry. That's what you should be doing. Basically the facade brick ceases to even matter. It's just something to protect your building from UV, from wind, from the bulk of the rain. It's just bulk water protection. That's what it should be. It should be there to take the, the heat 
take the brunt of the weather, and then protect everything else behind it, which actually does the energy savings and comfort control. So uh, to review, early failure is better. Keep your moisture priorities straight for your next project, your own project. And then continuity is king. And, and uh, if you want to have fun with a red pen sometime, I'll, I'll be happy to oblige. So if you want to take a picture of this as a, just my favorite building science links, this is a good, good slide. I think, well, you guys will have the, the slides after this as well, right? OK. But these are all great resources. Uh, a good podcast. Really like it. Uh, I like it because it really gets into it. Um, they don't uh, treat it lightly. They really, it's a really science-based uh, podcast, seven minutes of BS, building science. Um, and then building science podcast by Positive Energy. These are really smart guys and, and women who do this stuff for a, a living for many, many years. And I gotta say, uh, Canada and America is, has, well, learn from America, okay? It's made all the mistakes that can be made. So learn from all their mistakes and basically do better. So these are a bunch of resources. Buildingscience.com, just type it in, and man, there is reams, just books and books and books full of free, really entertaining articles. Joe Stebrick and John Straub, who uh, are the ones who started Building Science Corp, so entertaining. Look for them on YouTube, uh, just awesome stuff. This is really good. Love to share the love with you guys. Love those guys too. All right, so, and then the last slide is just to say, I would love to work on some future events together, whether it's a, a pen test workshop for your, for a designers group, uh, for Building Designers Association, or a plan review test, a plan review workshop. We're doing more stuff with Green Building Council. Um, and again, I'd love to do a live demonstration of Bernard Titanus test on, on a, if we can arrange something like that. It's all, always a lot of fun. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll step off the stage now. Thank <laughs> you.